Let's talk about East 7th Street. Uh, you know, every group that came to New York in 1948, 49, 1950, they faced their own challenges. Now give a listen to this poem, The Neighborhood. Safely perched in her third floor apartment window, a lifelong resident leans on pillows, carefully placed on her windowsill. Satisfied, she leans forward, viewing the ebb and flow of street life with a calm indifference, her sharp eyes not missing anything. Down below, in a scene played out every day, a crush of humanity parades under her window, workers returning home, exhausted, hammered in, hammered out, making enough to just to get by, struggling to hold on. The Second War had been over seven years, but there's some residents, the Poles, the Ukrainians, Hungarians, Russians, Jews, the war never really ended. Immigrants heard that in America, women smoked cigarettes, wore sunglasses, owned nylons, changed clothes every day, and even threw food away. Arriving with belongings crammed in cheap cardboard suitcases, immigrants soon learned that for them, the streets of New York were made of stone. Anyone who spoke English and wore suits stood tall, looked through the immigrants as if they weren't there, just something moving in the background. They smirked at their broken English, snickered at their ill-filling clothes. The newcomers heard their names. They knew what they meant. Polak, Jew boy, Dago, Greenhorn, refugee, farmer. The Irish came here a hundred years earlier, invisible, and yet everywhere at once. They were the police, city bureaucrats and politicians, who shut their ears and closed their eyes to the plight of the immigrants. What couldn't be taken away from the newcomers, stripped down or homogenized, was their religion and belief in a better life. Old women bent down on their knees, fingering rosaries, murmuring prayers in a hundred accents, praying to a Virgin Mary for freedom from the overpowering Iron Curtain that gripped Eastern Europe. On Second Avenue, Jewish garment workers congregated in front of a synagogue or Fourth Street, speaking in Yiddish, discussing politics, waving the liberal Jewish daily forward, making a point that Roosevelt was the only friend that labor ever had in the White House. Painstakingly, the immigrants learned English, and over time, helplessness gave way to hope. As they journeyed from the Lower East Side, their children and their children and their children's children unraveled the mystery of success in America, which was hard work, education, and the belief that in America, everyone had a chance. Thank you. In uh, Manhattan at that time in the 50s, almost every corner had a grocery store run by a family. Bread and butter. Not far from the Orpheum Theater was the corner grocery store on 2nd Avenue. Peering at the cold display, nose pressed against the glass, I stared intently at the food. Tubs of cream cheese, vats of butter. The next refrigerated case held meats and assortments of cold cuts. On the counter was a dizzying array of smoked and pickled fish. On the far side of the wall was the dairy case. Frosty bottles of milk and cream behind the grocer were the breads and packaged pastries. A hundred different smells drove me to hunger. Mother was buying food. The grocer's nimble fingers adding up prices on the shopping bed. Occasionally, Mr. Wageman would look up, smiling at Mother dressed in a summer dress, puff sleeves, her breasts rising evenly and slowly in time to the ticking of the store clock which was an advertising gimmick from a brewer that bore the legend, Miss Wrangle, 1952. <laughs> it was summer, warm days and hotter nights. In the coolness of the grocery store, the grocer added up the tally, finished, pencil tucked in his right ear, he and mother exchanged glances. Wow. Reaching with his large hand, he grabbed a bopgum made of rich dough and raisins. Here, son, I'm going to make you something special, right here and now, just as I promised your mother. Cutting the loaf, spreading butter, opening a jar of strawberry jam, one-handed, coating the bread with a thick layer, adding sprinkles of white sugar, sizing it, shaping it until he was satisfied. Leaning on the counter, he handed it to me. Smiling again in the privacy of an empty store, he said, I am a man of my word. His eyes meeting my mother's, the scene chaperoned under the auspices of Miss Rangel, the patron saint of broken dreams. <laughs> what I knew was what I could see and touch. 
I was only a kid then. There, my outstretched hand were two pieces of bread, transformed into the most delicious cake I ever had. Thank you. On 7th Street is a Catholic church still there, St. Stanislaus. And I went to that parochial school. And let me tell you, but I'm sorry. Where was the Oafia Theater? Second no, Second Avenue. Avenue. Still there. Still there. Uh, probably like uh, ninth. Between eighth and ninth. Eighth and ninth. Yeah, they're still there. The only thing that really is gone is the grocery store. That's gone. Okay, the Catholic school around here was tough. Sister Carol. Incomprehensible are the petty landmarks that lingers in a person's life. To me, it happened so long ago, but I still remember the scuffed wooden floors in parochial school. The sleigh-like desk bolted to long runners on the floor. Desktops open to store sharpened pencils and worn books. And in front of the classroom was a large blackboard. Two doors opening on the side. And of course on the walls hung a wooden crucifix of Jesus Christ. In St. Stanislaus parochial school, when Sister Carol held a ruler in her pale white hands, any signs of mercy vanished from her eyes. So much of her language went unspoken, her looks, gestures, the thin line of her lips held us in fear. Every school day was a gray morning of wanting to be somewhere else, standing by the door in a robe of dark as wool. Sister Carol counted us in, one by one, as we walked in silence. Hair combed, little backs held straight, and from her glance the message was clear. Grade school was not about deep thoughts or clever ideas. Originality was not in vogue. It was about small things that grown-ups winked at and often ignored. Issues, important like is the color of a beige. One dull morning, by mistake, I whispered to a classmate when I shouldn't have. Called to the front by Sister Carol, I was given the ultimate punishment, the ruler and then son. In her capable hands, my palms were lacerated. When I cried out, she turned my hands over until my knuckles bled. Darkness, the cuffs of my white shirt. That evening, my mother cried at my bruises. True, sister's time was not easy, teaching mindless brats such as myself only added to her disappointment. Over the years, attitudes changed, commitments weakened, and Sister Carol, childless and alone, realized much too late that her days of sacrifice and Catholicism, chastity and prayer, had been a life against nature. Even now my hands cringe into a fist when someone holds a ruler but the wounds are marked deep in my memory. <laughs> and she could hit, let me tell you. She could hit. Okay, and then in 1953, we moved away, moving away. Something was happening. Our apartment was unusually quiet, almost tense. I could tell by the way my father snapped the pages of the Sunday newspaper, staring straight ahead. He told my mother the neighborhood was changing. People were moving and somebody at his job described the place called Queens, where people had yards, better school, friendly neighbors, and all just a subway ride away. It didn't take long for mother to agree. You find out who your friends are when you're moving away. Friends say they'll miss you, others ignore you, anxious to get on with the next game. Eyes no longer meet, you're no longer part of the group, almost pushed aside, and then you realize there are different ways to be heard. We moved away from Manhattan on the hottest day of the year, August 1953. Too hot to go outside. Too hot to play cowboys and Indians. Suffocating days when old people groaned and sidewalks buckled. The movie men showed up, two guys in a small van. They crossed into Queens making free trips on the hottest day of the year. When everything was moved in and set up just like mom wanted, the moving men asked for more money. Not surprised, because they worked like dogs on the hottest day of the year. I asked my father the tree out front belonged to us. He said yes. And I asked, the backyard with the swing set? Was that a park? No, he said, that's our backyard. Two kids were playing marbles on the hottest day of the year. Mother said, go out and play, make some, make some new friends. And I did on the hottest day of the year. It seemed like only yesterday, but August came and went, taking away with it the awful heat that subdued everyone. In September, I started school, made new friends, 
and the next few weeks were exciting. There was a large cardboard box in the living room, and inside was an RCA Victor TV, which we weren't allowed to touch until Dad came home. It was the first time we could watch TV instead of waiting to be invited by people from the upstairs for party. A night in my room, I thought of the old place on East 7th Street. Once the center of my universe where I ran with abandon and played until dark, a place where people acted out their lives on crowded stoops, a time when secrets were kept in front of everyone, and tomorrow was always going to be better. <laughs> now we move up to the present day East Village. From the Lower East Side, which was rebranded in 1968, to the East Village, and the result was Instantaneously, the rents tripled. What a surprise. <laughs> yeah, surprise, surprise. So, oh, here we go. Club dancing. Now, this is present day East Village. It was just a club off St. Mark's Place, one of many, nondescript, steps leading down to a basement, loud music, cut rate drinks, a place where conversation was almost impossible. There was a group of us drinking, laughing, making cutting remarks, each one of us trying to sound smart. Ordering another round, my heavy hands rested on the table waiting for the night to end. Then I saw her, dancing by herself. Other noticed her too. Her eyes closed, looking to nowhere in particular. Color lights played on her skin. All the while she danced precariously, like an angel on top of a pin, moving and moving ever so gracefully. Someone said she was dancing for herself, someone else criticized her dress, but there was a tenseness in the air as we followed her with a wildness in her eyes. I said she was dancing, spinning and spinning towards an unthinkable place in the night. The table erupted in laughter and we ordered another round. The night slowly reached its climax, empty glass lit at our table as we fumbled to pay the bill. When I looked up, the dance floor was empty. The dancer lost somewhere in the night. Struggling, I made my way home through the empty streets, searching the occasional light left on in some empty window, waiting to welcome back a late night travel. In the fog of night, her memory thugged at me, and I wondered if she too had left the light on. Wow. Seen at an outdoor restaurant. They lived in one of those shiny new glass apartment houses near Beth Israel Medical Center, right off 14th Street. He worked for an IT company, spent his days trying to get ahead. She worked as a buyer for a department store. After a long day of shopping, they spotted a restaurant on a busy corner, tired. They quickly grabbed the table near the street, relieved to be sitting down. They sat in a short-lived silence, exhausted, content to watch, to, to, content to people watching. He noticed a yellow colored flyer discarded on the chair near him. Holding it up, the message printed in cheap block letters proclaimed, Jesus loves you. <coughs> what about the soul in the church? Smiling, she looked at him, wondering where his questions would take them. He continued, I doubt if the souls merge with God after death. Life is pretty much like a glass of water, poured into an ocean and lost forever. Seeing her puzzled look, he added, when the game ends and all the pieces have been moved, what do you think comes after that? Stirring her coffee, she looked at him. Religion is a commitment. Most people believe that souls struggle for their release after death. And perhaps there is a thing called reincarnation. I have a feeling something like that already is in us. Haven't you ever met someone who knew too much to have lived on earth only once? Their knowledge, their understanding of life, coming way beyond what we know. Surprised, he couldn't find the right words to respond. The afternoon sun was now behind them, throwing sharp-edged shadows against the nearby wall. Folding her arms across her chest, she leaned back, taking a moment to search her, his face. At that moment, a gentle breeze brushed against her cheek, reviving her, giving her strength. Composing herself, she calmly said, come finish your coffee. We need to take a long walk and talk about us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.